morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 415 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Monday, July 1st which means it's Canada Day, everybody. Ah, my second favorite day of the year after my birthday. (laughs) And that's only because my birthday is the only day of the year that actually is all about me. The other days of the year, I just pretend. So, (laughs) (laughs) ah, man, Uh, Canada Day. Uh, My, no, it's a great day across this nation. It's a good day for uh, family, for celebration, uh, also for commemoration, also for recognition of um, other things, because uh, as we know, not everybody celebrates Canada Day. Uh, Members of the Indigenous community have their specific reasons. Uh, Members of the Francophone community have their specific reasons. Um, So not everybody, it's not a joyous occasion for everyone, uh, but for those of us uh, for whom it is, I wish you an absolutely fantastic and wonderful day. And of course, we wanted to spend some of it with you. So here we are. A little later start because, well, I mean, it is a holiday, so we figured we'd get to sleep in a little. <laughs> ah, big thank you goes to our podcast funding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. But before we go any further, Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today, sir? Well, sir, I think it's pretty good. I'm a little tired. Uh, Mm. Lola woke me up very early, so I took her out for a long walk and came back and prepped for the show. So I'm only on my second cup of coffee, so uh, by the time we wrap things up, I might be fully awake. Okay. Well, let's try to gently get you there. (laughs) Uh, Unfortunately, no cup of coffee for me because, well... Like we all know, kids and cubs, I do not understand how something that smells so good could taste so terrible. But uh, I am perky, so I am with you uh, today. Um, Since it is Canada Day, why not um, start with a tiny, tiny little bit of history, courtesy of our friend Craig Baird from Canadian History A. Um, he has two tweets for Canada Day, uh, or for O Canada, I should say, our national anthem. Uh, one that appeared a week ago today, on the day of the Saint Jean Baptiste, mm-hmm. because a lot of people sometimes don't know this, but O Canada was actually first written and first performed for La Saint Jean Baptiste. So on June, um, oh, this one's not from Craig. Yeah. It's not from Craig. Uh, sorry, Craig he was Bear. writing about the, Craig Bear. Yes, but he was uh, writing about something else with regard to o Canada. Oh, uh, okay. and not and not uh, for Saint Jean Baptiste. But well, yes, the one became it, our it, national anthem forty-four years ago. 
Yes, on uh, officially uh, on uh, July first, nineteen eighty. Correct. Um, but it came into being one hundred years before. Yes. In eighteen eighty, uh, the song was commissioned by Lieutenant Lieutenant Governor of Quebec, the Honorable Theodore Robitaille, to mark the Saint Jean Baptiste Day celebrations in the city of Quebec on June twenty fourth, eighteen eighty. A performance which was also meant to honor the Congrès National des Canadiens Français, or the National Congress of French Canadians. Calix Lavallée, known as Canada's national musician, was asked to compose the music for a poem written by Adolphe Basile Routier. And uh, little known fact, but uh, there was a school in Ottawa. Uh, called Routier when I was a very kid, uh, when I was a little kid. It still exists, but it's not operational as a school. It's more of a community center and resource center mm-hmm. now. Uh, but it was a Routier school that I went to. So uh, when when I was in a great one, I didn't really know who Routier was. So it was only later on. I like, oh, I went to the school named after the guy. <laughs> Never knew that. Yep. Yeah. Adolphe Basile Routier. Uh, as intended, the first performance of O Canada took place on June 24, 1880, at a banquet held at the Pavillon des Patineurs, the Pavilion of Skaters, in the city of Quebec. The playing of O Canada for the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and York, later King George V and Queen Mary, when they toured Canada in 1901, helped to introduce the song to English speaking Canada. As the song became increasingly popular in English Canada, many English adaptations of its original French lyrics were created and sung across Canada. Arguably, the most popular version was written in 1908 by Robert Stanley Weir, later published in an official form for the Diamond Jubilee of Confederation in 1927. It gradually became the most widely accepted and performed version of the song in English-speaking Canada. Weir's lyrics, having undergone a few minor modifications from the original form, became the official English version of Canada's national anthem with the passing of the National Anthem Act in 1980. The official French version of the anthem featured the original French lyrics, which have remained unchanged since 1880. On January 31st, 2018, legislation was enacted to change the English lyrics to ensure gender parity. The verse, True Patriot Love in All Thy Sons Command, was changed to True Patriot Love in All of Us Command. No change was required to the French version. Well, don't forget the original lyric was Thou Dost in Us Command. Yes. The, the uh, in all thy sons command was uh, changed during World War One to honor the uh, the boys who were off to war, the sons of Canadians. That's why it was changed. And then people said, "Why did it change?" And I'm going to sing the original lyric. Well, the original lyric is "Thou dost in us command." So they just changed it back to more closely right. resemble the original lyrics. There you go. Uh, also, um, as we reported on the show, at uh, I believe it was an All Star game. I think it was NBA. Uh, yes, Julie Black, Julie Black. Yeah. sang the national anthem, uh, switching um, our home and native land to our home on native land. And I was actually thinking about that yesterday. I've been singing it that way for about a decade, if not yeah. longer. But I was thinking about it yesterday. Um, considering that, yes, the indigenous people were here first, number one, mm-hmm. but two, that not everybody who is a Canadian citizen was actually born here. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a double reason to want to switch it to on home of our home on native land. Not only mm-hmm. is it true, but then it would actually be, ironically enough, more, more inclusive because <laughs> it would recognize officially people who Canada is their chosen land, but not necessarily their native land. Well, I, I changed that lyric to our home on native land, and I also changed another lyric from uh, to let's keep our land glorious and free. Yes. Because why would a deity choose us over anyone else? Yes, indeed. Whether you and, believe and, or not, it's just the, why would they choose us over anyone else? So and even if it. one would, how would we know that they chose us? Well, that's and just, why would we uh, assume? Yeah. Why would we be so arrogant to assume they chose us this if there was the, one? Exactly, exactly. That's why I say let's keep our land glorious and free. I know Absolutely. that pisses off a few people, but I really don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. Now, now, as we mentioned in the beginning of the show, of course, not everybody celebrates, and I've already seen uh, online people get into some bun fights. Um, uh, you know, oh. the, one of the wonderful things about Canada is that we are free to observe or not, to celebrate or not, and we can all coexist doing it. Um, so those of us who do celebrate and observe, um, there's nothing wrong with us if we would choose to celebrate a land that we uh, love and that has given a lot to us. And for those of us uh, who feel that um, 
the nation doesn't represent them or hasn't served them or hasn't uh, done right by them and do not wish to market uh, the occasion in the sense of celebration. They want to mark the occasion in other ways. Mm -hmm. You're free to do that. Yes. Right? And uh, you're not a bad person for not wanting to celebrate today. Yeah. And you're not a bad person for wanting to celebrate today. Exactly. We all have our reasons. It's individual to all of us. Uh, well, that's the those, beauty of our country. We're allowed to right. have our own individual thoughts. And exactly. And hopefully for those of us um, who are observing, we do take a moment to acknowledge that uh, our past has been far from perfect, that our present is far from perfect, and that we still have a lot to do and that we commit to it. And for those of us who are not celebrating, I do hope that one day uh, things change enough here uh, that you would be willing to join us. In our celebrations, because there's always a spot at the table for you, as far as I'm concerned, and you're always welcome. But you decide whether or not you get to come or you want to come. We don't tell you you must. No, no, not at all. You, Everything you in their own decision. time. Yeah, you're free to choose as as you wish. Yeah, and it's as you know, it's my favorite day of the year uh, because mm -hmm. for me, I've always felt it was the most inclusive uh, holiday of the year because it's not tied to a religion of right. any type. Right. Or a culture. Well, maybe, but maybe. I've never seen it that way. Mm -hmm. Then again, I do sit from a place of privilege, but right. I think it's a day when, when and, and of course, living in Canada's capital for the last 40 odd years, you get to see people who love this country dearly and are thankful and grateful to be here. And you get to see people who have come to this country recently and celebrate it joyfully and gleefully because they've come here for a better life and have almost always found one not necessarily always the case but almost always have found one and today's just a great day to, to celebrate being canadian and again we understand not everybody feels the same way my beloved does not feel the same way about canada day that i do and mm -hmm. that's okay yep yeah. yep yeah. that's right we just we just need to make space for each other and avoid the word should mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. I like this. And um, just, you know, I'm celebrating. I'm not. I respect that. I respect that. And uh, there's no reason we can't all be friends. There's no reason we can't all be friends that we don't feel the same way about things. So long as we're decent to each other, that's what should matter. And, uh, well, being right neighborly is a Canadian thing. So hopefully there'll be a little extra of that today uh, when you're... Uh, in the presence of or having an exchange with someone who might not share your point of view. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right. Ah, uh, news. <laughs> do, we, do we want to do that today? <laughs> well, do we not? I know. I, yeah, of course we do. I just, okay. Where, where do you want to begin? Is, is I, I'm okay with not, but. Okay, well, let's start with some stuff. Um, there's been, we've been covering the whole Tommy Robinson Gold Gamari thing. Mm -hmm. And there have been developments. Yes. Goldie yes. is without a seat. She has been booted from caucus. Well, not without a seat. Well, you're right. Sorry, sorry. She's been sorry. booted from caucus. Yes. She has been booted from caucus. Uh, Doug Ford apparently uh, threw her out the day after or the day, the same day that uh, it seems that her story about her contacting, taking Tommy Robinson's call because I'm guessing she considered him some type of um, noted international expert in all matters related to the IGRC when his only qualifications is that he seems to hate Muslims. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Which, and, now, now, I don't know um, uh, if, if, if uh, she is Muslim herself. She's, I don't know if she's Muslim. She's Iranian she's Persian. Canadian, so, yeah, she's yeah. Persian. So. Uh, but Possible. she has uh, said she has uh, received uh, a few uh, slaps on the wrist from the National Coalition of Canadian Muslims and other uh, national mm -hmm. Muslim groups. More than once. Uh, more than once uh, for some of her comments. And, uh, you know, Again, the whole context of the Tommy Robinson thing was that very Islamophobic video truck that was yes. uh, uh, sponsored or purchased by the rebel. Well, they uh, own the truck. Was, they own the truck who was in the street who, uh, and uh, that Tommy uh, allegedly sponsored for these messages, I'm guessing. And 
Yeah. Uh, she, uh, one of the a complaint about her is that uh, if you're looking at her Twitter feed, she seems to be uh, representing in Queen's Park more for the people of Iran than from the people for the people of Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's a judgment mm -hmm. uh, that's unanimous, I'm not, not sure if I necessarily share it. I'm not that familiar, but that is but that has been a common complaint that uh, that has been surfacing a lot. Um, but it all stemmed here from the fact that um, she said that the purpose of their meeting was to meet with the, to talk about the IGRC, and then he basically put something out saying, "Well, he wanted to date her." Um, that caused, according to Global, posted June twenty eighth, Ontario Premier Doug Ford has removed a backbench MPP from his Progressive Conservative Party caucus after she met with prominent far right figure from the United Kingdom. A movie called one of a series of quote repeated incidents. So, actually, let me finish this and then we'll get into it. Uh, on fr on Friday morning, Ford's office announced Goldie Gamari had been removed from caucus quote, effective immediately, sending the Carlton MPP to sit as an independent. This decision follows repeated instances of serious lapses in judgment and a failure to collaborate constructively with caucus leadership and, as a team member, the statement said, while this decision did not come easily, it has become clear that MPP Kamari can no longer continue in her role within our caucus. In a brief statement posted to social media after her movie, removal, Gamari said, quote, when one door closes, another one opens and flashed a peace sign emoji. I'm not sure if that means that uh, somewhere behind the scenes she's being courted by the Poyev conservatives to run federally. Probably. Well, see. Gamari drew the ire of the premier this week after choosing to meet with Tommy Robinson, a prominent far-right figure from the United Kingdom. Robinson founded the English Defense League, a group that has regularly been described by researchers and advocates as Islamophobic and far-right. The meeting, which she scared a screenshot of on her social media, was met with fierce backlash from the National Council of Canadian Muslims, who called for Ford to remove her from caucus on Wednesday over the meeting. The Ontario NDP also said in a social media post that Robinson was, quote, a far-right anti-Islam activist and questioned why Gamari had chosen to speak to him. Asked Wednesday about the meeting, Gamari said she was, quote, not aware of Robinson's history when she agreed to meet with him online. She said she opted to speak to the far-right figure as an Iranian-Canadian immigrant concerned about the country's regime. Quote, he wanted to discuss the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which was recently listed as a terrorist entry entity in Canada, she told Global News on Wednesday. Quote, we discussed the RGRC, its impact in Canada, and the six-year effort of the Iranian-Canadian diaspora to put the RGRC on the Canadian terror list. Gamari said she condemned all forms of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. On Monday, Robinson was arrested in Calgary, where he was taking part in a controversial speaking engagement. A video he posted to his social media said he was arrested over an outstanding immigration warrant. In a separate social media post on Tuesday, Gamari questioned why Robinson had been arrested while someone she alleged was a supporter of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Court was not. Can someone explain this double standard? I'm confused, she wrote. The I'm confused part was particularly mm. true. I'm just saying... <clears throat> Robinson has been criminally convicted several times in the United Kingdom, including for contempt of court and for assault. Initially, on Wednesday evening, Ford simply said he was, quote, disappointed with Kamari's decision to meet Robinson, someone, quote, whose behavior and beliefs are at odds with our government. Now, Ford, of course, didn't say how or why those behaviors were at odds with his government. <clears throat> on Friday, the disappointment went further, and she was removed from the governing party caucus. Of course, the article doesn't mention why the disappointment went further. Mentions nothing about uh, the fact that she was contradicted. Mentions nothing about uh, Tommy Robinson saying he wanted to quote unquote date, yeah, aka bang her. Well, we assume. We, we assume. Let's do. The dude was in country for less than forty-eight hours, I think, and was already coked up and drunk and at a massage parlor. Hmm. Uh, to say he was a little hard up. <clears throat> Just saying. <clears throat> her subsequent statement claiming she wasn't aware of Mr. Robinson's history prior to the meeting speaks volumes about her judgment and honesty, Yelich wrote. Oh, yes, Ivana Yelich. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, of course. 
Yes. Yeah. The National Council for Canadian Muslims says Friday it was glad Gamari had been removed from caucus. Now, uh, this move from Doug Ford was followed by co comments by a lot of people, uh, people whose views I respect, actually, saying, mm. oh, gee, you got to give it to Doug Ford. He keeps a tight lid on his caucus. Well, because, I mean, he has ejected people before. And this sort of has uh, shades of Sarah Java and the NDP, where she's uh, sort of like freelancing without uh, consulting her caucus in ways that are not in the best interest of her caucus. And uh, Doug Ford had um, had the whole parliament censure her, the whole legislature censure her. Um, of course, it was probably mostly conservatives because they have a majority, so they can censure someone all on their own. Mm -hmm. um, I note that there's no censure uh, move for Golti Um So yeah. Uh, and now, of course, uh, this move by Doug Ford, even though it went public and she is removed from caucus, unlike the move from Pierre Poliev, uh, where he, he still hasn't done anything about his three rogue MPs who met with Christine Anderson. Uh, and apparently no journalist seems to be drawing the parallel and answering the asking the question about this. Um, yeah. Un but so unlike Pierre Poliev, he finally did boot her from caucus, still like Pierre Poliev, uh, there is no statement on the party webs uh, well party website i didn't check sorry but on the party twitter feed and doug ford's twitter feed uh nor is the news of her ejection from caucus anywhere on party letterhead mm. that i've been able to see so once again they're doing it in such a way that they hope that the people who like tommy robinson don't notice stealth everything is stealth smoke and mirrors now everybody's turning around and saying yeah we need to give ford go out look at ford like, doug ford does not get a cookie mm-hmm Doug Ford's first instinct was, if you take down the tweet mm -hmm. of you having a video conference with Tommy Robinson, then it, it will, will all go away. Yeah. Well, we, we will not advertise it. We will not make big noise. We will not draw attention to it. And that will be good enough. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't. But it's still not on Party Hill at her head, still not on the Twitter feed. Yeah. Hmm? And uh, I'm assuming she's Nothing been removed. Official. As, it's officially unofficial. Yes. And I'm assuming that she has been removed as the chair of the standing committee on justice. I would hope. Mm. One would, one but would it think. would seem that, and I have not been able to confirm this independently, but word on the tweet is that she was named to that position in 2023, but her license was suspended in 2021. Mm. which would have meant that Doug Ford knew that she was a lawyer with a suspended license before he named her his, or uh, maybe the committee elects its own chair, I don't know, but before she was made the chair on the Standing Committee of Justice, which whether, uh, which, whether if Doug Ford appointed her there himself or she happened to just be on the committee somehow or assigned to the committee and was elected chair by her fellow committee mates, um, did not provoke Doug Ford to say, um, uh, why do you have someone who can't respect the professional rules of her own organization who has had her license to law suspended as the chair of the standing committee uh, on justice? Is this some type of irony here mm -hmm. that I'm missing the joke on? Or, um, because <laughs> I can foresee a future when this is going to blow up in our face. Somebody yeah. who already doesn't have a respect, doesn't have enough respect for the rules to keep her license for the thing that she does to earn her living. Yeah. That's someone that you probably should not be given responsibility to. Mm. I'm Very just saying, true. especially if you know about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you think of the pure, the hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. housing, why not like this? You need a job. If you can't do the minimum to maintain your license to keep your job, again, I don't. You may be welcome. Maybe the there's something else. Party. <laughs> but it's. It seems to me that that's a bit of a hot mess alert. Well, one would assume. Anyway, so she is no longer in cabinet. It seems that the the government is trying to soft pedal that. It seems that he, even though he doesn't deserve any, he's getting cookies because again. This type of thing happens. This is so egregious mm -hmm. 
the ban was on Canadian soil. As a convicted felon, should not have been here. Because not only did she meet with him, but she publicly put her name and yeah. her MPP status to a tweet being outraged that he was arrested. And then when she, of the two tweets that she had and about that, him, the one she removed was the one having evidence of her having a video conference, but she didn't think that it was a good idea to also eliminate the one where she complained about him being arrested because he literally was in the country illegally. Mm-hmm. It's like, why not, why this guy and why not that guy? It's like, no, no, why not both guys? If the other guy did what you assume, what you allege he did, which for which you've provided no proof, and it could just be a random picture of some person that you just attribute to me to the IRGC, you know, because she basically said the man on the other picture was a member of the IRGC. If he's not, he's got it, and he's Canadian, he's got a defamation suit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, mm, not great. Not great there. So, uh, yeah, Doug Ford's first instinct, first instinct, because his first instincts are all always wrong. Well, yeah. Was to try to make it go away and keep her in her position. He needed to be asked more than once. On something that was fairly obvious and open and shut. This one was a layup. He's not the smartest. Bulb on the Christmas tree. Yeah. So, yeah, Doug Ford does not get a cookie. Doug Ford does not get a cookie, but it seems he did it fast enough to fool enough people to, to say, hey, look at him. He takes action swiftly. Mm-hmm. He this is the type of thing that you come out for, come out of hiding for. If you're premier and you go to a mic and you say that you've done this. He was too busy on his sea which is called the phone that he's mm-hmm. on 24-7. Yeah. Yes. I'm not, I'm, I, I am less than impressed with this move. Let's just put it that way. Can we uh, pivot to... Uh, yes. Daniel Smith and WestJet. Oh, I didn't know that there was a Daniel Smith angle to WestJet. Okay, but let's go to the WestJet. I'll read you her tweet. With tens of thousands of Albertans and their fellow Canadians stranded all across the world, the WestJet mechanic strike must end. The Labour Board's decision to allow the strike to continue during binding arbitration is a clear contravention of all norms, practices, and precedent when it comes to good faith labour bargaining. Alberta's government is calling on the federal government to make the expectation clear that work must continue oh. throughout binding arbitration. Wait a minute. The government has too much overreach. Now we want you to overreach. <laughs> uh, all right. One, I'm not familiar enough with labor law to know whether or not once binding arbitration is ordered, that prevents you from being able to go I don't into know. a strike. I don't know. I don't think it is. No, okay. because if it was, we'd have the federal government sending them back to work if that was the case. Yes. Uh, I would assume that it's not, but I don't know. There, there could be. A, that, that's not my expertise in, mm-hmm. in the matter of law. I would assume that uh, because um, it was ordered, but it had not yet started or whatnot. I'm not sure if both parties agreed to it at that time as well. Um I don't know if it was just suggested. Uh, but yes, uh, it was their last chance to go on strike, uh, given if they, were, if they were going to get involved in an mm-hmm. arbitration process. Uh, so they did. But here's the interesting thing. Um, WestJet mechanics mm-hmm. had uh, gone on strike, uh, which left some airline passengers grounded. Uh, they definitely picked um, the most strategic time to do it Well, prior to Canada Day long weekend. Um, this uh, Stampede starts next Friday. Exactly. But this was a second strike mm-hmm. because there was a surprise strike by unionized workers on Friday, a day after the federal government had ordered the binding arbitration. Mm-hmm. So the WestJet mechanics joined them yes. afterwards. And WestJet said that on Saturday, it was outraged by the aircraft's engineer's surprise strike. Uh, and uh, the president of the company came out. Some uh, came out, in fact, to say so. Um, it resulted in fire. yes. It resulted. Uh, it resulted in 235 flights being canceled across the country, affecting about 33,000 passengers that day alone. Uh, the airline said that a strike should be off limits, given that Ottawa imposed binding arbitration 
the union stands firm, saying that the strike is legal. Air passenger rights export Gabor, Gabor Lukas said uh, that if you're a passenger, this is some news you can use, uh, you could ask for a refund, but he doesn't recommend it if you still do want to fly. Mm-hmm. If you still do want to fly, it's important that you insist on getting a rebooking and that you get a good app to record your phone conversation with WestJet. Well, and, and they are, by law, they have to um, get you where you want to go if you demand a, a rebook, which means they might have to book you onto another aircraft at their cost. Yes. Now, uh, the West Chess president, Diedrich Penn, uh, said specifically, the stress, the devastation this is causing is unnecessary and hurts us. All of us were outraged, uh, basically. Uh, and then he also said... Uh, about the the canceled flights whatnot said that it's devastating if no solution is coming today we will be canceling another 150 flights today which was june 29th westjet said that it's waiting for word from the federal government on what they'll do and hope that an answer would come later that day on the 29th well this morning i woke up to the news that the westjet strike is over Oh, the airline and its mechanics union reached an agreement late last night. So all of Daniel Smith's posing and preening to try to blame the federal government was all for naught. Uh, once again, uh, WestJet says that there could be more disruptions in the coming week because of the labor dispute. Uh, the, um, the mechanics are back to work immediately. The union says the agreement provides substantial improvements over members terms. Uh, of employment and terms from the first tentative agreement that was rejected. WestJet says considering the impact the strike had on customers and the standstill the two parties were at, despite an order for binding arbitration, both parties worked together to agree on a deal. The strike was short but had a nationwide effect of tens of thousands of passengers being stranded. Um, more than On more than 800 flights were affected by the time uh, it was uh, the deal was reached. Uh, so uh, that it went up pretty quickly because it was 235 one day and another 150 that day. And uh, so it got up to 800. Uh, WestJet said that staff are now returning to work. The airline says getting back to normal service will take some time and customers should be ready to face more travel disruptions over the next week. Uh, and while all this was going on, um, it seemed that uh, Labor Minister Seamus O'Regan uh, seemed to be somewhat taken aback back by the binding arbitration call Mm. from what i can tell um but i'd have to look into that more but it seems that uh he he was under the impression that uh, directives that he had given or something that he had said uh was misinterpreted somewhere along the way uh, but I do not know much more detail than that uh, with, re- with regard to that aspect. But they are uh, back at work, so that was a, a quick one. And uh, I'm guessing that the union, uh, by picking its moment that strategically, mm-hmm. uh, kind of uh, convinced uh, the WestJet uh, brass. management, Brass, to come to the table and negotiate. Uh, now, I don't know how good that was going. I can tell that the based on the president saying how far apart that they were on the deal, that it wasn't uh, yielding results. However, uh, again, word on the tweet, have not been able to confirm this into independently myself, is that uh, um, the brass at WestJet wasn't being particularly proactive in speaking with well, that doesn't the members the least bit. Uh, at the moment. They, 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 if they could get rid of the union altogether, they would, I guarantee it. So oh, yes. they pay you as little as possible. Something I'm reading about, and, and, and it, it enrages me because, yes, this is the problem. This is the, Some people are saying WestJet mechanics make twice what the average Canadian does. Indeed. So? And they can't buy a house either. Maybe the problem is Canadians are all underpaid, and maybe WestJet mechanics are showing you all the way to fix that. Stop yeah. licking billionaire boots. Yeah. Sounds like you all need to join a union. Well, so I was thinking about this last night, and and something that troubles me about it is they the way they attacked the union, the way WestJet management attacked the union, hmm. made me think that they would like to get rid of the union altogether and pay their people next to nothing so that they can pad their dividend checks each quarter and return a larger investment to their shareholders. If they could have it done for free, their employees not get paid, oh, yeah. they would. Oh, yeah, of course. You remember during JB's talk about a UBI, how um, the southern states said they would all go out of business if slavery was abolished. 
mm. because free labor is what enabled them to uh, create the country. Well, the country was built on slavery for sure. Yes. There's no question about it. But the funny thing is they created a new type of wage, a new type of slavery, and that's wage slavery because it's actually less expensive for a company to pay a minimum wage. And in the minimum, United States of America, it hasn't changed in 15 years or 16 years. It's $7.63 an hour. It's less expensive for them to pay you minimum wage than it would be to have you as a slave. Well, yeah, I guess you, so, were you don't have to pay for someone's upkeep. Food, clothing, shelter. That's always going to cost you more than seven sixty three an hour at 38, 35 hours a week because they don't want to give you 40 because then you're full time. Hmm. They figured out a way to enact a new type of slavery and it's wage slavery by keeping the wages as low as possible, lobbying Congress to keep them low. Now, thankfully in Ontario, we've had... Uh, a raise to the minimum wage, but it's still not nearly enough. And people seem to forget that the minimum wage meant to be the minimum amount you need to have a life to live upon. It was the minimum living wage. Well, that's not the case anymore because you can't live on it. You can't. And companies have worked around getting, having full-time employees by having full-time part-time. Hmm. You get 20, 30 hours a week, which means you need a second job to make ends meet or sometimes a third job. Or you join the gig economy and drive for a specific company whose name begins with you and ends with Burr, as an example. And the gig economy is another way to get around actually paying you anything because you're right. not an employee. You're seen as a contractor, which means you get zero benefits. And all you get is a stipend for the rides that you provide. Uber doesn't pay you. Right. The customer pays you. Right. So this gig economy, this keep the minimum wage down, it's all bullshit. It's all about how the wealthy stay wealthy and powerful and keep us under their boot heels. So when WestJet Brass comes out and says inflammatory things about how the union is being reckless, I'm like, go to hell. They have the right, the legal protected right to form a union and demand good wages for the work that they do. And I myself would like to see that the people who are paid to keep the aircraft functioning and flying safely are paid a good wage. Yeah. So, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. The people that are expect us to save us if things go crack or boom. Yeah. I want, I them, want them to be well. paid well. I want them to be professionals. I want them to be, what's the magic word? Experts. <gasps> Wash your mouth out with soap. I want experts to take care of the aircraft I'm going to fly. You can't on. have that. I know. According to Pierre Polyev, it should be common people that do it, or electricians that capture lightning from the sky. While riding planes. On top of them. Yes. Ah. Just getting those lightning <laughs> bolts and throwing them in my satchel. We've all seen Thor, right? <laughs> Do -de -do -de -do -do -do. Productive day. Do -do -do -do. Productive day. <laughs> Look at all this electricity I've gathered. <laughs> Let's sell it. Oh my God. Oh, um, Speaking of electricity and selling, oh. do you, did you know that originally Tesla, when he was building uh, at Wardenclyffe, he built a massive Tesla coil and the idea was to distribute electricity the world over for free? Um, he was shut down very quickly by uh, J.P. Morgan when he discovered, when Morgan discovered, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not making any money on this. Shut it down. Mm. Electricity free for everyone on earth, courtesy of Nikola Tesla. He figured out a way to do it. They shut it down and destroyed all of his documentation regarding it. Jeez. Why? Wow. Why? Because I got I'm already uh, one of the richest men on earth, but I need to make more money. Greed will kill us all. Indeed. Indeed. Um, we have some birthdays yes. to mark. Yes. Apparently, Mademoiselle Fox's mama, mm -hmm. Mama Fox, it's her birthday today. So happy birthday to you. And Kid Jen, it is your birthday as well. And you are here in the chat. So um, <clears throat> breaking out my best Marilyn. Happy birthday to... You. 
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> ah, I love Canada Day birthdays. So great. And my friend Jacques, by the way, happy uh, birthday to you. I know he's probably not watching, uh, but I'll just put it out there. It's never a bad idea to put some birthday wishes out into the universe. All right. Other things going on. Um, those are the some some of the bigger stories we were following. Uh, if you happen to be live in Cal living in Calgary, uh, Mayor Jody Gondek said that they're getting closer to resolving the water system crisis, and it could be resolved by sometime next week. Um, I have to say that after a terrible start, uh, the city's communications have improved immensely. Mm -hmm. uh, now they'll probably never live down the first impression, uh, but they did clean it up. They really did clean it up. And you'll see it here in the statement. Very clear, very concise, and uh, um, no ambiguity here. The mayor said, There are four steps that we need to take before a safe water supply can be restored from the Bear's Paw treatment plant. The pipe needs to be filled, then flushed, then water quality needs to be tested, and then we begin to stabilize the network. Great news on step one. Filling of the pipe was completed at 6 p.m., yesterday. Uh, so I'm guessing that uh, yesterday, in that case for us, is the day before yesterday. Uh, now she says that once the flushing of the pipe is completed, like I said, the Alberta Health Services will be getting testing the water to see if it meets quality standards, and then stabilization will begin. But Gondek says that Calgarians will need to continue to conserve water for the next few days. So uh, it seems that Calgarians are doing what needs to be done and are all pulling together to make sure this happens. So um, let's hope that uh, the fix does come about. And if it does, it will have come back, come about in a very, very, very fast time for these types of projects for municipalities. So it seems that uh, it really wasn't all hands on deck effort. And uh, it looks like they're uh, on the way to making it happen. Uh, like I said, tech willing, in this case. So uh, a fumble. Uh, off the start, uh, mm -hmm. but it seems to be a very professional, co competent job uh, since then. So you got to give props where uh, where they are deserved here on that. Uh, let's see, what else do we have for you today? I, I have something I think you'll enjoy in case you, okay. didn't, if you didn't see this. So let me just blow the tweet up and I'll put it on the screen. This is from uh, Derek Guy, or Derek Gee. I don't know if it's Gee or Guy, at Die Workwear. Um, Derek uh, is a menswear writer, editor at, um, creator of RL Goes Hard, bylines at the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, Esquire, and Mr. Porter. And he's the editor at, editor at hang on, i got to look this up, put this on, sorry. You're going to appreciate this. Okay. This is, this is good. So this is Derek. I don't know if it's Guy or Guy. If anybody knows, please correct me. Uh, I'm not super familiar with his work, but he says, unconventional pairings like a t-shirt with a tailored jacket can look great if the clothes are cut beautifully. Oh, yes. But if the clothes are not cut well, often too tight, they just make the outfit, outfit look worse. Yes. Yes. He's been on a tear lately as to the, uh, regarding the makeover of Pierre Polyev. And he has not a, been kind. <laughs> no, and he has a cool one out uh, about um, um, how people dress their dogs versus how people dress themselves. And the dogs are all more stylish, <laughs> way more stylish. Well, and he actually points out like all the, but he's been doing that. He also, he's, he does a whole bunch of political commentary using fashion mm -hmm. as his way in. Oh, yes. Uh, and the comments, it's absolutely, it blows my mind. Because all the things that he says about fashion are absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And he finds a way to link them. <laughs> well, he's talking here. Because in, 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 it's, a, it's a left photo, right photo. Right. And left photo. Uh, the right photo is Pierre Pol Polyev, uh, not exactly tailored looking jacket. And here it says the first photo is of Vittorio Salino, uh, a bespoke tailor who trained under the famous Florentine tailor Antonio Lever Leverano. Notice the extended shoulder line, longer jacket, and higher rise trousers. When clothes are cut so beautifully, styling them in very casual ways can make you look more comfortable in your clothes. Like, I have these beautiful clothes, but they are not a big deal to me. In my opinion, the second outfit, that of Pierre Polyev, makes you look uncomfortable in tailored clothing. First, the jacket is too small. The man likely realizes this and feels uncomfortable, dressed up, in quotes. So he wears it with a t-shirt and some jeans. 
To me, the outfit says you are uncomfortable in tailoring. Try too hard to look trendy and likely shop at expensive trendy stores that overcharge for clothes. It doesn't look cool, natural, or elegant. It's just downstream of early 2000 trends that already feel outdated. Ouch. <laughs> Scathing. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. I love it. I love it. I love it. Ah. Little fashion commentary. Yeah, I, like yeah I, th I think it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, because it's, uh, there's something about when someone tries too hard, mm -hmm. right? There's just something about when someone tries too hard, and um, yeah, I, I'm. There's a great take. I have here a problem with that. From at Sailor Lass, this is a great take on this. I know it's petty, but any opportunity to, to criticize the second guy's fashion style is welcome. Given, as a Canadian taxpayer, I contributed to his upkeep. <laughs> ah, I think that's great. That is really good. Um, now, I will send another one for, uh, to you, Mr. Grizzly, here for, to, to put up. Because um, it sort of goes, it, it's connected. Uh, because the conservatives... Um, unfortunately and it's been the case for a good long while have no sense of humor and whenever they joke it's rarely funny because the jokes are punching down and they just can't seem to be happy mm -hmm. about stuff so like interest rates go down they get mad inflation goes down they get mad um you know because well their narrative is that canada is failing and anything that shows that canada is not well and they seem to have some problems with people being happy. So um, even though it's Canada Day, let's take a moment for our national hour of dour. <laughs> As the party that fun forgot has dark clouds hanging over the nation thoughts about someone having the ability to feel and express joy among their fellow citizens. Uh, yeah, just, let me just blow this up a bit here. Okay. This is uh, seeing geez. people being happy seems to make them miserable. Certainly looks like it. This is from uh, Chris Warkington. Now, who is this? Yes, who's well, an MP? Member of Parliament for Grand Prairie, Mackenzie. Liberal Caucus, we have some serious questions about your leadership. Trudeau, the man is uh, dancing, having a good time, enjoying life in Markham, Ontario. At a big barbecue somehow. <laughs> That, and there's always got to be one at every party, right? Yeah. Instead of dancing, what about... It's like, instead of you coming here and trying to make this moment about you, how about zipping it and letting the moment happen? The same. Speaking of, how about zipping it and letting the moment happen? Uh, I'm going to go on to some unpopular territory. Oh, okay. uh, But people know how I feel about this. Uh the Pride Parade took place in Toronto yesterday. It's the largest one in Canada. Often it's the largest one in North America in terms of attendance, not the size of the parade. The size of the parade, that will always go pretty much to New York City. Uh, but in terms of attendance. Uh, now, it seems that for the second time in a decade, the parade was disrupted. Now, the last time it happened, it was the Black Lives Matter movement that decided they were going to try to hijack the parade to make it about their thing on that day, even though it was the day that the Prime Minister of Canada for the first time ever... Um, well, technically, that's not true. I've heard that Joe Clark did it way back when, mm. participated in the Pride Parade. Uh, but it's, it's been billed as the Prime Minister of Canada, the first time the Prime Minister of Canada officially marched in a Pride Parade. Uh, and it was also the year of the shooting at the Pulse nightclub in Florida. So it was very celebratory for us because we were uh, being recognized for the first time officially. So we were being told, and it was also a day of mourning because, you know, uh, within the gay community, we believe that none of us are free until all of us are free. And when stuff like the Pulse nightclub shooting happens, which was the largest mass murder mm -hmm. uh, uh, shooting 
of that type. Um, and the people from uh, Black Lives Matter came along and hijacked, uh, I mean, they were made marshals of the parade uh, by the Pride Committee and then used their position there to uh, sort of hijack the parade. And I believe Smoke Bob had been released and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but the parade did get to go on. Uh, this time, the parade was intercepted in some way or interfered with in some way as um, a group of protesters against Israel's war in Gaza made their way into the procession. Pride organizers canceled the rest of the parade, but added that they respect the right to protest because the parade itself was born in protest over police raids over several bathhouses in 1981. Um, my position is the same here. Now, I know that people are turning around and they're saying genocide is going on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which makes me taking this position much more controversial because, so, well, don't you care the fact that genocide is going on? Of course no, we do. I, I, I care that genocide is going on anywhere that it's going on, right? Um, we should not be treating people like that, period. Mm -hmm. um, but we get one day a year. This movement has gotten every single day since October 7th. And there's never a day, if you believe that genocide is going on, there's never a day to stop mm -hmm. protesting against genocide. And I not, it's not as if the rainbow community is against this. It's not like we're against protest. It's not like there isn't a segment of the gay community that isn't very militant in favor of Palestinian statehood. We know what it's like to be oppressed. So, um, right. Um, again, not causes, not nobility of cause, but tactics. Not sure that that's the best way to make allies. When someone has just one day, just one day, a year that's theirs mm -hmm. and you can't even let them have that it gets backs up especially if it's a group that has made room for you or that is traditionally shown that they were willing to support you um now also i have no idea if there's a link between this but it's not as if over the past um year and a half or so that there hasn't been a lot of unpleasant interaction mm -hmm. between members of that community and members of ours. We had trans protests at schools. We've seen young children indoctrinated by their parents to stomp on our flag or spit on it. We have, um, and the irony is, is that the, the anti-gay pride, anti-rainbow triggered by rainbows thing was nowhere near as strong this year as it was last year. No, thankfully. Thankfully. Um, but Muslim Canadians, uh, rainbow Canadians, are groups that um, people who want neither of us to have our freedoms uh, often try to pit one against another. Um, I'm sure that there will be some people within the Rainbow community, I, I'm not one of them in this case, but there will be some people uh, making comments uh, and wondering why, why it is, again, people associated with a certain religion are once again making us targets. Because mm -hmm. we recently had National Ind Indigenous Peoples Day, and I don't remember the pro-Palestinian groups disrupting those activities. We had St. Patrick's Day, and I don't remember them disrupting those activities. No. They were probably out getting liquored. Just saying. Yes. The, 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 I'm guessing that the non-Muslim people among that yes, we're probably yes. out getting liquor on St. Patrick's Day. Um, but on our day, we were. Um, 
listen, uh, if you want to bring attention to your cause, as Black Matters did, Black Lives Matter did, uh, you did it. Congratulations. Your event was successful. Mm. Uh, if it was about making friends for the long term, I'm not sure you made new friends. Those you, you already had probably supported you. I mean, the Pride Committee canceled the rest of the parade. So either it was so disruptive that it couldn't go on or everybody turned around and said, yeah, you know what, you're right. But at <sighs> our community once in Toronto had, or I think actually did have a pride parade canceled one year mm -hmm. before it even started because of the Israel-Palestine issue way before this latest uh, series of really tragic and unfortunate and devastating and painful events, horrific events happened. So again, it's, this is not new to us, our community, um, the union movement, for example, which is very pro to us LGBTQ plus also happens to be very pro Palestine liberation. There is uh, that famous word that seems to bother a lot of people, a lot of intersectionality between our communities to begin with. So not sure why it is we should be making strategic and tactical moves to deny each other our days when we have them instead of working together. Because mm. I'm sure that they're given the popularity of this issue with certain segments of the gay the rainbow community, typically the more militant ones. Uh, but still, uh, that there would have been no problem with a group organizing uh, and marching in the parade, as in, you know, rainbow community for Palestine, for example, and making their protest known as part of the parade. Mm -hmm. Not sure why the parade needed to be stopped. I know that it's a big media event that grabs a lot of attention. Therefore, if you want to get on the news, that's a good one to go after. But, um, I just, like I said, maybe it's selfish of me, given the size of the devastation that is going on over there. Yes, but it would just, it just seems to me that if you want to build, if you want to have an event for one day or be noticed on one day, that's, that's exactly what you do. That's it. If you want to build a long lasting allyship with the group so that you multiply the voices calling for the thing that you need and that you have more people able to take over to run a, like I said, to run a leg of the relay when you get tired for a bit, that you don't deny them the one day of the year mm -hmm. that they get to get together among their, um, now, of course I'm saying this from a perspective of being in Canada. Yes. Where you are protected and safe. and Yes. If I was in another country, let's say, like if I was in Israel right now, maybe I might, and, and I was Jewish, I might not hold the same view. Right? Uh, or, well, if I was gay and if I was in Palestine, uh, my views on my my neighborhood accepting my community uh, and my expectations would probably be way more tempered. <laughs> so I probably wouldn't hold that view mm. at all. I wouldn't have the luxury of it. Let's be honest. Um, so yeah, it's, um, from what I can tell, uh, like I said, uh, I, I don't know whether or not the Pride Committee in Toronto decided to suspend uh, the rest of the parade for actual security reasons because there were so many and the protests got, uh, I was getting out of hand or just out of uh, solidarity because with our community, it could be either one. Uh, and I'll try to take a look uh, while uh, Mr. Grizzly's talking later on to see if I can find more details than that. Mm -hmm. But like I said, uh, these, th this type of thing, it, it makes me uncomfortable. And you know what? Maybe that was the point. I believe it was actually. So, um, so then again, just to make uh, you feel uh, uncomfortable, to make you think. 
Yes, exactly. And so, so like I said, I'm of mixed emotions because mm-hmm. I see the point. It's just, I just wish that people would stop denying us our day to be able to make their points. <laughs> yeah. Just give me a second. So, I got to jump out for a sec to fix something. I'll be right back. All right. So, yeah, there you go. Uh, probably not the most popular position uh, I've ever taken here on the show. Um, and it's not because I don't want the issue resolved. I, I definitely do want the issue resolved. I don't want to see any people um, being hurt um, in any way, shape or form. So, but uh, just like, uh, I guess, my opening statement that, you know, whether you celebrate or not when it comes to Canada Day, um, you know, let those who want to celebrate, celebrate. Let those who don't, not. Um, I wish it could have applied here too. Well, I, I like the comment from Carol. I can't show it on the screen. I've lost all access to do oh, the comments. Okay. So, I'm, so I'm checking this out on a different feed. But it says, there's lots of fee, fatigue over the protest. This was their way of keeping it in the news. It didn't make it right, though. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah. It was their way of keeping it in the news. It doesn't make it right, though. Yeah. I, I understand, you know, that they've, why they did it. You know, there's a big spotlight. There are millions of people watching both online, in person, and I believe it's televised on city TV. I could mm-hmm. be wrong about that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of eyeballs on it, and they know they'll make the national news. They'll know they'll make the international news to a degree. So it was a strategic move. I understand why they did it, and I don't disagree with the message. I think just sometimes you deliver the message differently. Maybe that was the wrong place and time to do it. And and that's my take. Do I disagree with what they're saying? No, I just think they saw an opportunity, took it, and I didn't think it was the right thing to do. But that's me. I'm, I'm not protesting what they're protesting. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm very much against genocide in any way, shape, or form. There's nothing kind to joke no about, right? But I just think it was... I, I think it's probably turned a lot of people off is is my take and i'm sure they knew that going in i'm sure hmm. it was you know calculated we're gonna we're gonna lose people when we do this but we're gonna get you know on the news but here's the thing that everybody seems to fail to realize that's protesting the the war in Galista, in gaza is is that all the protesting you do amounts to zero zero it amounts to nothing because you do understand these are, uh, you know, a country attacking what should be seen as a state, uh, two states, in another part of the world where we have no political sway over any of them, either party. We have no political power, no political sway. We can't just say, stop doing that and think they'll listen. They won't. Netanyahu is going to do whatever the hell he wants as proven by what he's done. Yeah. The only person on earth who could effectively bring an end to this is the president of the United States because they have the largest, most powerful military the world has ever seen. They could bring an end to this, but we can't. And protesting in the streets of Toronto or Ottawa or Calgary or Montreal or whatever community you reside in is not going to change a damn thing. Go to a protest if you want to let people know your thoughts, or maybe just put them out online on social media to say you're against it. But protesting in the streets, trying to get yourself on TV to let people know we're against this. Yeah, we're against it too. But it's not, it's not going to change a damn thing until political powers that have the ability to sway it and put an end to it, do something, nothing is going to change. And I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. Mm -hmm. It's, it's true. All the protesting in the world isn't going to change a damn thing. You also have to remember, whether people realize this or not, that there are powerful lobbyists in Congress who sway the Congress people to do their bidding. And some of those powerful lobbyists work for companies that manufacture the arms that are provided to both combatants, by the way. They're profiting off of this. 
Every time a bullet gets fired, that's cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. If you've seen the film Lord of War, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Mm. Mm. Somebody somewhere is getting rich off of this. They don't want it to end. Mm. Good point. Good point. Um, reading here in uh, from the Toronto Star here. Thousands of people danced and sang and celebrated at Toronto's Pride Parade on Sunday until the procession was suddenly stopped mid-route and then cancelled by a protest. About 30 demonstrators calling themselves the Coalition Against Pinkwashing held banners and chanted on Young Street, just south of Wellesley Street, three and a half hours after the parade's 2 p.m. start. Floats and marchers making their way south toward the parade's finish at Nathan Phillips Square were stranded behind the protesters who chanted, Free Palestine and Pride is a protest. Uh, yes, but Pride is a protest for rainbow rights. Mm -hmm. It's not just Pride is a protest, so I'm going to bring any old issue to it and protest. And given that Protest the demonstrators call themselves coalition against pink washing. Mm -hmm. So clearly we were specifically targeted here. Close against pink washing, pink washing. What though? Mm -hmm. I'm having a feeling just by the taste of that name, that their primary concern is not Palestine. You think? And I would be very surprised if there were a lot of Muslim people among those 30. Yeah. After, and 45 minutes after the protests began, Pride Toronto announced the remainder of the parade billed as Canada's largest was cancelled. We made the decision to cancel the remainder of the Pride Parade out of our commitment to ensuring public safety, Pride Toronto spokesperson Anna Lee said in a statement. While we deeply respect and uphold everyone's right to peacefully protest, our foremost priority is the well-being of all participants and spectators. So even if we consider that our Pride Parade because a lot of people say that pride isn't protest anymore. But uh, considering that the number of people that get upset about like issues like public nudity and, oh my God, here are the rainbows again. And well, why do they get a full month and veterans only get and whatever, right? It's like, um, people seem to fail to understand that given how certain people feel, feel about us, just waking up every day, breathing, and daring to be happy and live a live a fulfill a fulfilled and full life mm -hmm. that's rewarding is an act of rebellion. Hosting the parade where we're on a float, maybe in a bathing suit and a water pistol, gyrating to the latest beats. Yeah, it looks like fun, why not? But it it actually is a protest. Yes. There are a whole bunch of people that would really, really wish we would not exist. Well, I, And we are being very, 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 very visible. I, I said to a colleague a few years ago, I said, I would like to come a day when pride is no longer needed or required. Yes. And it just be a celebration. Yes. But it's still needed and it's still required. Yes. And... Uh, as evidenced by last year with the uh, bizarre string of hatred that came out of left field, you know, demanding, well, people who work in schools by, by uh, what was it, in Alberta? Was it Alberta or Manitoba where somebody tried to change the legislation where we get to choose who, who teaches gym and who teaches Manitoba. music? Manitoba. And I'm like, why, why those two? Oh, I know why those two subjects. Because mm -hmm. who's usually the music or arts teacher may have, might be, might be a little life, light in the loafers. And a female phys ed teacher might be a, a little... A little manly. Manly. Yeah. 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 According to a pamphlet handed out by the group, the protesters had six demands, chief among them, the divestment from all corporations actively involved in violently exploiting native people on Turtle Island and in Sudan, Palestine, and the Congo. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're here for Palestine, protester Leila Salman said, and we're here to draw attention to the cause because that cause has gone completely unnoticed since October 7th. Apparently. 
Toronto police gathered further down the parade route, but did not take any action with the protesters who left Young Street about two and a half hours after they shut it down and marched west along Wellesley Avenue Street on the sidewalk. Police said they had adequate resources to address the protest, but were respecting Pride Toronto's request that officers not interfere if the protesters disrupted the parade, police spokesperson Lori McCann told the Star. It was not in a familiar situation. In 2016, a Black Lives Matter group brought the parade to a standstill when it stopped its float for more than 30 minutes, similarly refusing to move until officials met their demands. The parade continued continued after Pride leaders signed the list of demands on the spot. But this year, the demands went unsigned. Protester Faisal Samir said Pride Toronto offered a meeting to think about the demands. And while the protesters sat in the street and chanted, the party continued just a few blocks over. Celebrations and bass-heavy music continued on Church Street, where vendors lined the pavement and restaurants overflowed. That was the atmosphere for most of the day along the parade route as spectators pressed against metal barricades five deep at points for the entirety of the 2.5 kilometer route, dancing, singing, and cheering as business groups and organizations marched by. That included Sibol, S-I-B-O-L, the Filipino-Canadian Pride Network that formed last June. The group danced and waved the flag of the Philippines as it celebrated its first anniversary. Quote, there was no formal organization like us before, said Leo Gubak, one of the group's founders. That was a source of inspiration for us. Why don't we create one for this group of people in the community so we can find community and camaraderie together? The group wasn't alone. As many as 500 of the 1,760 volunteers registered for this year's Pride celebrations were believed to be recent arrivals to Canada, something Pride Toronto's education and volunteer manager attributed to the flood of legislation and violence against LGBTQ communities around the world. New Canadians who happen to be rainbow understand that we are free nowhere unless we are free everywhere. And therefore, when they get here, start paying it forward mm-hmm. by volunteering for Pride. Come tell me that new Canadians are not a benefit to this country. Yeah, no kidding. Come tell me that. Oh, 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 and, then, and, and, and then try to not have me laugh in your face. Did you see what Mad Max did? Uh, yeah, I did see that, but I'll finish this article and we'll, we'll get okay. to him because he's, yeah, he was way off. Wow. Vo- volunteers helped facilitate the parade, a mammoth march with hundreds of groups participating, floats blared Britney Spears' toxic and womanizer while drag queens danced in a TV helicopter circled overhead. Chris Collins drove in from Kitchener, Ontario to march with his company, the Ontario Teachers Insurance Program. The company provided him with a pride shirt, but he had a vision for the rest of the outfit. So he added rainbow sunglasses, suspenders, a hat, and bow tie. And then there was a centerpiece, rainbow pants with peace signs and music notes purchased on a trip to Chicago, Illinois this spring specifically for the parade. The pants say it all, said Collins, who had marched in the Pride Parade since 2017. You can't walk five minutes down the street without people stopping for our look, but it's been great. Everyone's been so social, so friendly, so fun. It's just a great time. There you go. And that's what it should be. Mm -hmm. Great time. Because yes, there's protest, but yes, we celebrate also how far we've come. We also mark how far we have to go. And we also take a moment to realize that uh, the benefits of acceptance have not been distributed equally in Canada and certainly not throughout the world yet. No. So there's more work to do. But you do it all. It all happens on that one day. Indeed. Because on other things too, we mourn people that we've lost HIV. Oh yeah. Yeah. So there's sadness, there's joy, there's uh, all of it gets put into this like big pot and becomes something you know if you the the movie inside out Mm -hmm. uh and inside out 2 is out now right now i'm doing box or box office by the way uh three weeks in a row that's kicking butt um awesome but at the end of inside out like this we were introduced to the concept of mixed emotions Mm -hmm. rolling stones here we go Mm -hmm. if pride isn't if pride isn't a celebration of mixed emotions Juneteenth that just happened in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's mixed emotions. Like something terrible happened. It's not happening anymore as much. (laughs) So we're celebrating it. How far we've come. Because, but we also know how far we have to go. We also know that not everybody is benefiting. And we've lost a lot of people along the way. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that's common to most movements. One would think. Right? It's not any different just because we have boom, boom music, uh, less clothing, and seem to have uh, a bit more joie de vivre. Well, it's usually pretty fabulous. 
Yes. But the variables may change, but the constants are the same. Well, and, and do you remember last year when, when you, myself, and Alex were out on, mm. was, was it Saturday night? And yes. We were, it wasn't super crowded at that point. Nope. And we, it was a Saturday night, and we had met a, a, a woman who was not yes. that young, who had just come out. Yes. And she was just celebrating her absolute freedom for the first time to be who she is. That she's living her authentic self. For the first time in her life. Yes. And she was saying how she struggled for decades and how much, you know, and she's like, and look at all the three of you. I go, no, it was just the two of them. They're together. I'm just their friend. She goes, oh, and when did you come out? And I'm like, uh, I don't know, a couple hours ago when we got here. And she looks at me, <laughs> what? I go, no, no. <laughs> and then you're like, no, no, he, he's, he's not gay. He's just an ally. <laughs> There was a bit of a language uh, yeah. barrier there too, as well. <laughs> but it was it was a moment um, that that reminded me why it's still needed and required yes. for somebody who has struggled with their um, sexuality, their identity, their entire life to be able to suddenly be who they really are and no longer be afraid of being who they are. That's why it's still necessary. That's one of the myriad of reasons why it's still very much necessary. And mm -hmm. there's work to be done. There's still work to be done. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, hey, um, not all the prides are done just because Pride Month is over, mm -hmm. right? There's much more. So uh, because I know Vancouver hasn't had theirs yet, Ottawa hasn't had theirs yet, Quebec City hasn't had theirs yet. So uh, there's still a lot to go on. So if you have an opportunity this year, uh, and especially if you've never been to one, mm -hmm. I guess, check one out. Check one out. It's a love fest. Everyone is welcome. All right. <sighs> Let's get some happier news. Because we have some uh, uh, news? Canadians who have made us proud. Oh. Okay. To celebrate. Like, oh. Um, yes. Uh, Canadian tennis player, uh, as we mentioned, Marina Stakusic, has uh, made it to her first Grand Slam. She's playing in Wimbledon, uh, which has started officially today. They had the qualification tournament last uh, week. Uh, but the official tournament starts today. And a Canadian tennis player, Denis Shapovalov, who has been having a couple of uh, up and down seasons, mm -hmm. um, he's still not ranked uh, in the top 100 because he's having some trouble stringing together two, three, three, three matches in a row. Um, but for the second Grand Slam in a row, uh, took out a seeded player uh, somewhere along the way. So, um, this last in the, at the French Open was Taylor Fritz from the United States, I believe. And uh, here it was uh, Nicholas Jarry from uh, Chile, who was ranked number 19th in the world. Okay. And Denis Shapovalov won, won the, the straight sets just, uh, just before the show started. Uh, so uh, congratulations to him. Moving on to the second round uh, of uh, Wimbledon for the, the fourth time, I believe, consecutive time. So uh, good for him. Uh, but hopefully uh, he will have a good enough run to bring him back into the top 100 where he absolutely belongs. Um, because he's been having such a tough year, he wasn't actually named to the Olympic team this year either. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Uh, uh, Felix Ogiali Sim was named, and then the second uh, man named to the team was Milos Ranic. Um, who's uh, actually having a pretty good season, even though he has a very limited one, a short one. He doesn't play so much on clay. It's not so good for his hips. Um, but he usually kind of tries to play a couple of tournaments and then pops in around the time of uh, Wimbledon and then stays in the season as long as his body will hold up, mm -hmm. hopefully throughout uh, the, the Canadian Open and the, the U.S. Open along the way. Uh, but yeah, he, he will be there and he'll be playing doubles with Felix Ogialiasim there. Uh, Gabriela Dabrowski, of course, has been... Uh, named to the team and she will be playing doubles because she's one of the top five female doubles players in the world. So she'll be there. Um, and she uh, won a uh, Wimbledon warm-up tournament uh, about three weeks ago and then uh, was a finalist in one uh, just on the weekend. Um, she'll be playing doubles with Leila Annie Fernandez who will be uh, registered in singles as well. And Leila Annie Fernandez made uh, her first final of the year on grass at Eastbourne just before Wimbledon starts. Uh, Rebecca Marino in uh, one uh, a tournament in Italy, England, uh, on grass. Unfortunately, she lost her first round qualification match, <laughs> so she wasn't able to ride that momentum. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Bianca Andreescu made a final on grass. So I don't know what what it is with Canadians on grass this year, but uh, making finals uh, four four finals in three weeks. 
for a Canadian Sawgrass. Uh, so hopefully it will be a good Wimbledon uh, for Canadians uh, who are there. Um, also, in terms of Canadians who have made us proud, um, this weekend there was the track and field nationals in Montreal. So uh, many uh, Canadian athletes officially booked their tickets for, for Paris there. And uh, the Paris Olympics are now in less than one month. So um, it, it's getting exciting as uh, Team Canada and all the various sports are naming their teams uh, that are going. Our rowing team also uh, named its uh, its national team. And uh, it's really interesting because growing up, uh, rowing was one of our marquee sports, right? where we had several boats and we used to count uh, for several medals. So I'm guessing we might be in a rebuilding phase because we've only had two boats qualify out of all the races that they're on rolling. Uh, the women's eights, and I believe uh, lightweight skulls, pairs, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but both of them are indeed medal contenders. So um, we have got two, uh, so it's not quantity this time around, but quality uh, for our rowing team. Uh, the, men eight, the men's eights just missed uh, qualifying uh, by like one spot at, a, at an event. A couple have said, like, I think it was even like a, I think it might have not even been a full second over the over the length of the race. Eight people like this, I think, was like less than a second. So uh, that's just, like, just so close. Um, in soccer or football, um, Team Canada is at the Copa America for the first time. And uh, they won their first ever. Well, their first match was against Argentina, which is the best team in the world. So they lost 2-0. But apparently they were very, very, very competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, the they did, they, was yeah, quite something. Exactly. It's apparently the goalkeeper stood on, an Argentinian goalkeeper stood on his head because oh, nobody Canadian understood how. Goalkeeper. Oh, the Canadian goalkeeper. Well, yes, but the Argentinian goalkeeper too because no, no goals went in. No, well, uh, well uh, Canada didn't have a lot of opportunities to score. It's the, the Canadian keeper kept them in the game so that it was yes. a nothing loss. Okay, so, uh, and then um, they played against oh Peru and, and one, won, one so the one zero one nil. And then yesterday they played against Chile, uh, and they ended up with a draw, which was enough. So uh, Team Canada, in its first ever Copa America, advances to the playoffs as one of the top eight teams. They're in the quarterfinals. Uh, the quarterfinals. So uh, there you go. Go Canada, go. That's uh, some great, uh, uh, great inspiration, great achievements leading into the Olympic tournament, which will be coming up. So it's always good to have some good results going in. Mm -hmm. A little belief, a little momentum. So um, yeah, and our golf team uh, this year, whomever they will be, uh, will definitely be going in on fire, particularly the men. Because over the last three, four weeks, if you are looking on the results on the PGA Tour and Senior PGA and everywhere, um, top tens, uh, top fives, uh, somewhere along the way they were leading. Uh, Todd Pendrith in particular is on fire. I think he's like picked up like a win and a couple of top tens all in the last few weeks. Um, so there might be, uh, might be something to look forward to from uh, Canadians playing golf as well at the Olympics. Uh, we're still trying to get Devin Haru on the show he's extremely busy because mm -hmm. once again the man has been tapped to do the two marquee events so he's got swimming in week one and track and field in week two so he'll be covering and he's been at the nationals he was covering the swim nationals and the track and field nationals which of course has been keeping him very busy in the lead up yeah. uh, he's but taking he leaves over for steve armitage who famously did swimming and track who retired exactly. a couple of years ago. Uh, due yeah. to, he had health reasons that he had to step down. Devin filled in, and then he came back, and then he retired. Yeah. And uh, Scott Russell, mm -hmm. you might uh, recognize, uh, has announced his retirement after this one. Oh, yes, yeah. So um, don't be too surprised if someday in the new f near future uh, we see Devin Haru anchoring the Olympic broadcast. I can see that happening. I can see that happening. I'm calling it. It's mm. going to happen at some point. If there, if if he already, at his age, has got the assignment of the two marquee events, I I, I cannot see a reality in which he's not hosting the show, unless he decides he'd rather actually be at the events. Mm -hmm. And says no, possible. thank you. But in the studio, you get to interview because everybody that wins or performs well mm -hmm. gets to come in for an interview, and whatnot. And 
man, God, that man can interview. He's really good. <laughs> He's really good at his job. So, uh, um, where essentially wherever he is if he's in if he's in the general area put him in coach anywhere you put him in he's gonna do a great job <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah i i'm i'm happy to see him get uh the marquee assignments at the marquee event and uh he, he's got a beautiful future ahead of him so uh hopefully um like I said with uh going back and forth from place to place and trying to organize himself because he's going to be in paris for a good long while because he's going to be there for the whole olympics and paralympics so it's probably going to be over a month in a row so you know when you go away for over a month uh, there's a lot of things to prepare <laughs> make sure people are taking care of your plants and things like that so i'm sure he's a very busy man but hopefully we'll be able to get some time with him before he goes so that we can talk and uh, geek out on some canadian athletes um our track and field team in particular uh, must mention that uh, at the, the last Olympics, won two gold, two silver, two bronze, and the track and field team um, being a little bold, but saying uh, that anything less than that this time around will not be acceptable. I, I agree. Um, I think that's, have a, that's, that's pretty much how the team feels as well. Yes. Our throwers, our sprinklers, our decathletes, among others. Um, that, that's where the stuff, uh, not so much in the jumping events, because uh, for a while we were doing pretty good at, uh, at high jump. And uh, for a while we had uh, some, uh, some good contenders in heptathlon as well. Not the case. Uh, keep an eye on the women's 4x400 meter relay, because they have been knocking on the door for so long that all they need is like a, if the team gets on a roll, uh, that might be the fuel that it needs to to medal this time, uh, which would be really, really nice because uh, that team has been putting in the work, really has. Uh, so we're going to have a lot, to, a lot to cheer about. So Wimbledon first, then mm. Olympics. Well, so mm -hmm. I will be... Oh, in Copa America, yes. I will be in Calgary at the Stampede next week. Excellent. And I am going to shoot some footage. I picked Excellent. up some new uh, mini micro wireless mics. And I've got my gimbal stabilizer. I've got a bunch of stuff ready to go. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot a bunch of video at the, and I'm gonna see if I can crash a certain politician's barbecue. Uh oh, <laughs> maybe a couple of politicians. What are you plotting and scheming, Mister? Well, you'll you'll have to wait and find out. Oh, but wait, I have to show you something. You're give showing a, leg. Give me a second. I'm gonna go. Get You're it. showing leg. You are teasing. I have to show you something. You're gonna like this. Just a second. <laughs> okay. He is teasing kids and cubs. Look at him showing some ankle. <laughs> ah, I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Uh, I know he also talked about Max, so I'm figuring we'll get to there. So before he comes back, um, just I'm going to mention very quickly here uh, for Howdy those partner. of us. Who, oh, hi there. I'm just mentioning a little something before we uh, before you come in here. Uh, for our Canadians living in Atlantic Canada, uh, you might want to get prepared because the first major hurricane of the 2024 source season, uh, 2420, that's right again. The first major hurricane of the 2024 season Season, has island nations in the Eastern Caribbean on high alert. Storm watchers say that Hurricane Beryl stands out for how quickly it's strengthened into a Category 4 storm. Local officials are telling people to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Uh, it's expected to pass just south of Barbados this morning before heading into the Caribbean Sea. Um, it's on the path towards Jamaica with winds as fierce as 215 kilometers an hour and large destructive waves predicted for when the barrel makes landfall in the Windward Islands. Uh, those are southern, generally larger islands of the Lesser Antilles, such as Cariacu, Dominica, Grenada, Martinique, Petite Martinique, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, for example. So that area. Uh, but uh, Barbados also will probably be affected here. Um, the, pri uh, the Prime Minister of uh, one of the... Um, nations in Barbados shared a video of local people heading, heeding the government's advice to haul their boats out of the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mia Motley called on people to conserve water. She's the prime minister of Barbados. Uh, she says it's early for this. We're talking a month or more ahead of schedule. And it uh, only took 48 hours to reach the status of category four, uh, which was very, very, very quick. Uh, according to news reports this morning, um, it's churning its way into um, 
Barbados uh, in Bridgetown. Uh, people were hammering metal sheets over the windows to prepare for the storm, uh, which seems to have been downgraded to Category 3, uh, which is better than 4, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, really. <laughs> It, it, it's it's academic um so yeah it seems that uh according to the latest weather reports saint lucia grenada tobago saint vincent and the grenadines are all under hurricane warners warnings as it's expected to make landfall and uh not sure yet what uh, the projections are about how it will affect uh canadians in atlantic canada when it finally makes its way up the Atlantic, whether or not it'll be far enough out in sea that it won't uh, affect uh, the region too much or whether or not they'll be hit. But uh, in the next coming days, uh, we'll probably be hearing more about that uh, as it will affect Canadians. But so just uh, be prepared to know that it could be coming. All right, Mr. Grizzly. So um, Bridget's mom picked up this hat Ooh, for me. La, 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 la. This, this is a, uh, a Tom Campbell smile hat from Calgary. This hat is probably 75 to 80 years old. And I gave it a good scrubbing, cleaned it up, and reshaped it because uh, it has to be a cowboy hat for, for Stampede, right? So I've got, uh, I've got it all decked out. I'll be wearing this at the Stampede uh, next Saturday. Mm. We like it. We like it. Very stylish. Oh. Yeah, and like I said, it's about 75, 80 years old, something to that okay. effect. Yeah. Um, speaking of Alberta, uh, it seems that uh, Premier Daniel Smith is a little confused. Because, He's a lot confused. <laughs> yes. But apparently she has come out and uh, stated something like, uh, yeah, us in Alberta, we're going to opt out of that federal dental care problem program. Thank you very much. Uh, which had a lot of people going, um, how do you do that given that it's an insurance program that people apply to individually and nothing is asked of the province in any way, shape or form She's not for it bright. to occur? She just wants to separate. See, here's the thing, right? We're all talking about in the United States, Joe Biden, because he had a senior moment at a debate that, oh my God, he's done and whatnot. And um, we have, uh, at the same time, we have uh, Donald Trump uh, telling people that Joan Rivers voted for him in the 2016 Republican election, well, presidential election, even though she died in 2014. But it's Joe Biden we're worried about. We have Danielle Smith that uh, steps up and says, yeah, we're going to opt out of a program for which we don't have to do anything. And nobody's <laughs> wondering about her uh, mental competency for the job she holds. But Biden is so old. Yeah. But the other guy believes that people that were dead two years before an election voted for him and that the person told them. I'm, uh, yeah. Um, well, here, one thing uh, about the GOP, I guess um, dead voters really do exist. It's just that they vote GOP. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> uh, man. So, yeah, I don't know, man. Um, Daniel Smith, um, come here, darling. Person, woman, man, TV. <laughs> Repeat after me. <laughs> Worried about you, girl. <laughs> I just. <laughs> God. Yeah, we're going to opt out of this thing that affects us in no way. Just looking to pick fights. Like I said, she's a separatist. She wants to end CPP and install an Alberta pension plan that we all know uh, the company she wants to have do it has lost billions over the last couple of years. Yeah. So That she ran on not doing, but apparently is going to do anyway going now. to do it anyway. She just wants to separate, but what she has to understand in that all of the prairies is on treaty land. You ain't going anywhere. The crown and every province and 
every tribe and band would have to get together and agree to separation. And of course, if, if that were to happen, if that were to happen, you need to remember that because it's treaty territory, they, the, the, the individuals who own that land would probably say, yeah, you, you can separate, but you, all you get is like Grand Prairie. That's it. Y'all got to move there because the rest of this belongs to us and we let you live on it. It's why there are casinos everywhere in Alberta because they have the right to open them any damn well, any damn place they want to. There's no provincial jurisdiction over that. Hmm. It's not a reserve. It's all treaty land. Right. And for those of you who may have forgotten what that looks like, let me just put this little map on the old screen here for you to see. You can see Treaty 6, 7, 8, 10, and 4 make up all of Alberta. 8, 10, uh, 6, Saskatchewan. 4, or Saskatchewan with part yeah. of 5. Yep. Two parts of five, two, one, and three. And a little bit of two. Manitoba and a little bit of two, correct? And four. <laughs> yeah, really. It's all treaty territory. All of it. All of it. Only about a third of BC is treaty. Uh, and these are the numbered treaties. There's also territorial treaties, which don't show up on this map because right. this is numbered, right? Right. So, yeah. Good luck with your separation thing. <laughs> Jeez. All right. I have, now I have two quick. Things. Oh yes, Before you had you said you had something about uh, Max as well there. Yeah, Mad Max Bernier. I got a video. It's uh, how long is it here? It's one minute. It's exactly one minute long. This is Maxime Bernier being Maxime Bernier um, in in PEI. Yeah. And <laughs> judge for yourselves on this one, folks. To no, stay. Now you can stay, but when they're gonna be expired? We will see at that moment. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, some of you have their permit that they are expired. Nobody is standing nobody here. Have, here. Nobody is here. illegal. They have your, their permits. But in your group of 100 people, nobody that is expired. And, and if they would have been expired, they would have been deported. Okay, but they will be deported when it be expired. You're this is what? No, doing, no, because no. They won't said, be deported. You just said that when it's gonna be expired, they will be deported. They will be legalizing their stay. No deportation will be needed at that moment. Uh, but we will need the That's why I you need to have full knowledge. You are a leader. I think you should have a full knowledge a full before no, you get no, no, I have a full knowledge. This I'm saying when like the it. permit is expired, you must be the permit. You're saying my permit no. is expired, it isn't. No, no, if it's not, but it will be in a couple of weeks or in a couple I of months. I can extend it. But I, I hope they won't because we don't need <laughs> they you. They will. They, no, we don't need you here in this country. How can you decide it? Because For example, they, listen they, to there's me. Canadians, listen. there's young Canadians no, 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 that can me. work at Tim Horton. We then need, they can. I'm not working. At yeah. Okay. Number one. Max thinks that was a win, by the way. So yes. do his supporters. Yeah. Um, Max is wrong. Max is always wrong. Always wrong. Um, yes. If people overstay their visas, they are at risk of being deported. But it's not like there's somebody from uh, Labor Canada or Immigration Canada that's sitting there going, eight, nine, ten, oh, okay, you're exported. Just load them up on a plane, send them out. They have the opportunity to apply for extensions. Yes. Yes, they have the opportunity to leave of their own free will first. And then if it seems that they haven't done it and it's been a long time that they haven't done it, it's like then deportation. But it's like Max Bernier used to say, like, like as soon as your thing is over, then you you get deported. Uh, does, no. he, does he have a transporter? <laughs> no. It, it doesn't work that way. It's not like the day after your thing expires that somebody, you get a knock on the door and say, yeah, we're grab your stuff, we're rounding you up. It, it doesn't work. There's not way. enough personnel <laughs> to do that. <laughs> now every person works for CBSA. <laughs> it's just, Max. And as, that young man had the patience of a saint. Yeah. That, that young man knew civics better than Max did. Does that strike you as a shock? And it's like, uh, I think you should know what you're talking about before you come here and talk. I don't know what you're talking. Well, you know, you don't. Clearly. And he says, you're a leader. You should know this. <laughs> I thought that was great. Right. Max showing his racism card. Young Canadians can work at Tim Hortons. Hey, Max, you ever been in a Tim Hortons? <laughs> 
Not a lot mm. of people that look like me working in Tim Hortons. And that's basically his coded language. That's what he's trying to say. Yes. yes. What he's trying to say. We need more people who look like me serving me my donuts. That's what he's saying. We don't need you anymore. Patalo. Well, it's kind of like how, you know, uh, Trump has gone on about how he intends to deport something like, I don't know, several million people mm -hmm. in the United States of America. I'm like, your economy will crash in a heartbeat if that happens, because you do realize how much of the U.S. economy relies upon paid under the table and under minimum wage workers who are migrants, some of them illegal, some of them, some of them just migrant on a work permit, but they get paid less money, less than minimum wage. You do realize that the state of California, were that to happen, would come to a screeching halt. Somebody's got to do my lawn and my pool. That's the attitude a lot of people have. Well, guess what? The people who take care of those things, the people who work in nursing homes, the people who make hospitals run, those people that you don't see, there's millions of them. And without them, your country will stop. Food will rot in the fields because nobody will be picking it. Hmm. It's a simple fact. It's a simple fact. That's it. It's hmm. an undeniable truth. Their economy relies upon migrant workers hmm. and illegal workers because people yeah. want to pay next to nothing. Yep, yep. I've um going through some of the chat because um on my main screen for some reason it's stalled for anything except for chat that's coming in through uh through uh Twitter. Uh, but notice that uh, Kit Cassie mentioned uh, that the pro-Palestine uh, groups uh, blocked the Winnipeg's Pride Parade too earlier in June. Oh, really? I yeah, that. hadn't heard about uh, that that bit uh, at that time. Uh, but yeah, there you go. Right. So I, I do have one. Uh, I have one quick video to show you. It's it's okay. not long. It's not long, and I think it's fitting because this is uh, by the man who was uh, called uh, the greatest Canadian. Tommy mm. Douglas, and since the passing of Donald Sutherland, who was yes. Kiefer's grandfather, or Kiefer's father, and, and his grandfather was Tommy Douglas, I thought I'd share this video. Perfect. This is uh, from quite a number of years ago, but it's uh, it's a testament to why he was voted in as Canada's greatest Canadian. I think that medical care is so important that it ought not to have a price tag on it. I think that we have come to the place where medical care, like education, ought to be available to every citizen, irrespective of their financial state. I think that Very short medical and sweet. care is yeah. so important. But to the point. Yep, I concur. I absolutely concur. Um, speaking of uh, Canada Day, I uh, saw a comment also from uh, Tavi G., uh, noticing that uh, there was a CPC, there was a commentator on CBC that was uh, complaining that the Prime Minister was not in Ottawa uh, for Canada Day this year, kind of linking it to when he went to Tofino for the first uh, National Truth and Reconciliation mm -hmm. Day in order to leave uh, the space, the whole space, to the Indigenous community. Um, well, yes, the Prime Minister is not in Ottawa. Um, he's in Newfoundland and Labrador. Because while in Canada, um, all of Canada, we celebrate Canada Day, mm -hmm. uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador in particular, Canada Day also happens to be Memorial Day, yes, which is a somber and historic day, uh, and particularly this year, because uh, the province has an unknown soldier mm -hmm. that is being entombed at Newfoundland's National War Memorial with a full military funeral. What a bastard the Prime Minister is for going there yeah. on Canada yeah. Day. Apparently, that's yeah. the narrative. That's the narrative. Um, Newfoundland's unknown soldier was killed more than 100 years ago in northern France and is being laid to rest today. He was lying in state in the lobby of the provincial legislature all weekend. Thousands of people paid their respects. It was an emotional time for relatives of soldiers with no known grave. Um, so a lot of them made a point of uh, going over the course of the weekend. Uh, the soldier is being placed in a tomb made of granite and um, labor labyrite, labradorite, I believe. 
it's a, I don't know what, I've never heard of it before, but I'm guessing it's a type of stone. At the Newfoundland National War Memorial, he was repatri repatriated from France in late May to represent everyone killed. Uh, but for Wade Lester, uh, this is according to the CBC, he stands for so much more. Quote, well, it's freedom, that's democracy, and we've got to keep it intact, and sometimes we may have to fight for democracy, said Wade Lester. Canada's Prime Minister and the Governor General, along with other dignitaries, will be there to pay respects. So while 500 members of the Royal Canadian Legion, 800 forget-me-nots are being left inside the tomb as a symbol of re remembrance. So I'm guessing that uh, not only the Prime Minister is ambassador, but so is the Governor General, as well as the 500 members of the Royal Canadian Legion who will be going. Because I'm guessing it's not just one person being there that would make it make wouldn't be just the prime minister going that would make him a bastard i'm guessing it would be everybody that could have been in ottawa instead but didn't right mm -hmm. or are we or are we doing a sliding scale ruler again commentator on cbc <laughs> who decided to try to make this a thing personally i have no problem with our prime minister being there no, no that's where he should be. be that's where he should be that's where he should, should be, be yeah, yeah. Special coverage of the memorial uh, began at 7.30 a.m. Eastern time, so it's probably over by now, uh, and 9. Uh, in, in, here. Yeah, 9 Newfoundland. Um, oh, 9 Newfoundland, sorry. Yes, yeah, 7.30, 7.30 Eastern time was being broadcast uh, on CBC, uh, but you might be able to check it out if you're interested in that afterwards uh, on YouTube or uh Maybe it, uh, it'll be a standalone on uh, the CBC Gem website and whatnot. Uh, but this evening, please, uh, if you have the opportunity to, if you're not doing something somewhere else or if you're recording it for to watch later, the Canada Day concert happening at Libretton Flats Park. Uh, it's a two-hour show, and uh, it will feature performances from Chromio, Metric, Maestro Fresh West, Neon Dreams, uh, and a whole bunch of other people will be uh, hosted by Isa Isabel Casico again, mm -hmm. who generally does a very good job of it. Um, also, uh, if you are uh, out uh, shopping today, you may notice in your coins that there's something new. It seems that uh, last week, 3 million new coins commemor commemorating the 150th birthday of Lucy Maud Montgomery went into circulation. It will feature a portrait of the much-loved author, as well as Anna Green Gables, a pen and a paper, as well as Montgomery's signature. Marie Lemay, who's the president and CEO of the Royal Canadian Mint, uh, says, uh, the only thing is I just want to temper everybody's expectations. By the time they get into circulation, often people say, we don't see those coins. Because what happens is that when you see one, you usually want to keep it. Exactly. So you take it out of circulation. So if you see one, keep it. <laughs> That's the advice of the CEO of the Royal Canadian Mint. Uh, the coin was unveiled in Cavendish, Prince Edward Island, where Montgomery was raised and is buried. So there you go. So one more thing I've got for you here, and then I got to wind it up. I got to get a couple of things taken care of before I head to a Canada Day celebration in my speedo. Uh, and uh, it's it, it revolves around the Ontario Science Center and how we figured out a way to fix it. Yes. Figured no, we just uh, figured out a way to get the roof fit. Doug Ford's going to take care of it, courtesy of Michael Deatter. <laughs> <sighs> What's a beer center? The Ontario Beer Center. Yeah. X out yeah. signs, put in beer. Dougie will fix it. Beer. 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 A cup of coffee. Beer it is. No, I said coffee. Beer. beer. Coffee. Beer. C O B A. <laughs> love it okay that might get copyright infringed i might have to that edit might. that out yes uh a couple of things to mention before we go uh, a little more on the international side um on uh, june 30th was the first round of elections in france remember there were snap elections called by french president emmanuel macron uh, after the European parliamentary elections. Um, well, uh, the first round of elections did not go well for Emmanuel Macron. Um, 
The far right is on the verge of taking power in France. This is the way the media is spinning it. Early results suggest the national rally got 34% of the vote, not enough for an outright victory, mm -hmm. but far more than the left and the centrist alliances. Uh, Marine Le Pen, who's the leader of that moment, who spent her political career trying to take France's far right from the fringes to the precipice of power, she said uh, that democracy has spoken. Uh, the bloc of President Macron has been erased and... Uh, yeah, that's what she said. Uh, now, uh, calling the snap election was a gamble for Macron, and he lost it. Uh, he had bet that Volkers would balk at the prospect of the Rassemblement National, that's the RN, actually forming a government in France. But as the ballots were being counted, uh, other parties began maneuvering to block the RN or national rally in a final runoff vote next week. So I believe it's July 7th, uh, the top two parties uh, get together and have a runoff vote. Gabriel Attal, who's the current prime minister, called for a broad alliance to ensure the RN does not gain a majority. So right now, um, the bloc, the the bloc of left and centrist, uh, uh, sorry, uh, not the left and centrist alliances, but the the bloc that did uh, finish along with Le Pen's bloc in second place is now going to try to campaign to get uh, the votes of the people that voted for Macron's bloc to try to bring themselves over 50 and block Le Pen from becoming uh, the leader. Um, well, that would be a good thing because she's dangerous. Yes. Now, the day before, uh, there was uh, thousands of people protested the far-right national rallies by participating in uh, gay pride celebrations. Um, tens of thousands of people marched, and they said that they'll face greater di di discrimination if the far-right national rally forms the government. The interior minister asked police to provide extra security for the parade on that day uh, because the national rally is a socially conservative and anti-immigrant party that has previously voted against expanding rights for the rainbow community. Last night after the vote, uh, there were some protests and a little bit of mayhem. Protesters tipped over trash cans and set off flares after the results came in. Um, the results are a set back for the president, of course, whose centrist coalition came in third place behind a left-wing alliance. Uh, so like we mentioned, the left-wing alliance and Macron's centrist alliance will try to make a, get into some deal-making in order to get 50%. Um, elsewhere in uh, Europe, as things are going from bad uh, to worse, Hungary takes over the European Union's rotating presidency today. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, Viktor Orban, who is a longtime critic of the EU, says that he, quote, wants to make Europe great again. Where have we heard that before? My God, these people have no original ideas. No. Uh, the populist leader repeatedly claims that the EU, EU threatens Hungarian sovereignty, is destroying its middle class and its agricultural sector, and is about to shake up the power structures in Brussels. Uh, for its part, the EU has in recent years held tens of withheld ten billions, tens of billions of dollars worth of funding to Hungary over Orbán's many violations of the bloc's rule of law principles. Was while he's been leader, uh, Orbán has taken away the independence of his country's judiciary and media, and hasn't bothered to correctly implement the asylum and immigration laws. Now. The only good part of that is that uh, the rotating presidency of the EU lasts six months. So uh, I'm not sure how much uh, making Europe great again he's going to be able to accomplish at that time. But hey, have at it, buddy. <laughs> uh, and the last thing that I had uh, for you um, today uh, is relates to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, the Supreme Court of uh, the United States is expected to issue its ruling in the immunity case for Donald Trump. A uh, former president is facing charges for attempts to overturn the 2020 elections results and a whole bunch of other things, and he argues that his actions were official and as president that he is immune to all prosecution. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how the Supreme Court will rule on that because I know that the Supreme Court would probably love to give him total immunity, but given that Joe Biden is the president right now, if they rule that the president has total immunity, well, they basically just given Joe Biden the authority to say, um, no, I don't no. respect the result of the next elections. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just exactly. going to say. So, um, yeah, not exactly sure how it is that they are going to decide this one. Uh, it seems that uh, Trump has also named his uh, vice president pick. Who is, which is Republican Senator J.D. Vance, the guy that uh, wrote the book The Hillbilly L. Elegy. Mm -hmm. And that seems to have taken a turn to the right since then. Very much uh, so. Yeah, not quite sure exactly what it is. But yes, it seems that he is his, uh, his uh, Trump's vice presidential pick officially. 
And not um, Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> and not and not Aaron Rodgers and not uh, not Doug Burgum. Yeah, really, Aaron Rodgers. Um, in other news that might cause some celebration, um, Steve Bannon reports to jail today. Oh, well, happy After Steve like, Bannon reporting to jail day if you celebrate. Yes. And for those of you who don't, it's okay. We can still coexist. Exactly. But there might be much gloating. The forecast Maybe. calls for a little gloating. Bit. And perhaps a little derision. Uh, but yes, uh, Senor Tres Camisas is uh, going reporting for jail today. Apparently his last attempt uh, to stay out of jail was uh, quashed by the Supreme Court. Now, of course, this is not a long stint. It'll only about one month. This is the case for having defied the subpoena to testify before Congress. Uh, Peter Navarro, the other person who did it, has, uh, is also uh, already gone to jail for his one month. Uh, but Steve Bannon also has that uh, infamous build the wall grift mm -hmm. trial coming as well which will probably send him to jail for many 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 more years if he's found guilty and because in that case it's state charges there is no possibility of a pardon should Trump win again so i don't know if you saw this this is in different news this is from mark carney i'm going to put this on the screen and read it to you uh, is there is there some subtlety taking place here? He says, what a joy to wake up here. The fortune of being born in a small Canadian town, growing up in a time of enormous opportunities. The challenges we face, we can solve. Together, we can renew that spirit of boundless possibilities and shape the next Canadian century in the finest place in the world. Is that maybe a... That sounds very campaign-y, rallying-y. Yeah. I'm Mark Carney, and I wish to be your next prime minister. Well, I mean, I approve this message. It sounds like it. <laughs> it sounds and we like may it. be reading things into it that we want to hear, you know, possibly. But you know, it, it sounds like it. Sounds like it. Could be. Stay tuned, kids and cubs. Mister Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. I'm no sin. I'm having really good hair today. Look at all those body on the. Oh, shut up! Damn. <laughs> I have to go shave. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, kids and cubs, uh, just as, as, as a quick note, uh, because I, I'm allowed to speak a little bit more about it. Um, Beaver Sweetie is okay. okay uh, but uh, I guess he uh, did have a car accident on uh, Thursday night. Um, everybody seems to be fine physically. Uh, the car might be a write off. However, uh, so expensive, uh, uh, and, uh, it, it's been a tough few days, uh, because when you have an accident like that, um, fortunately for me, I was not in the car at the time. Uh, but as they say, most accidents happen within five minutes of home. And that was not the, that was the case this time. Yeah. So it was just about a four block walk, uh, to be able to go be by his side after it had happened. Um, but, uh, when something like that you, happens, you get a little rattled. Oh yeah. Understandably so. Uh, so, uh, emotionally, uh, my beaver sweetie is not as well as he could be. Uh, so, uh, hopefully, uh, helping them work through that, uh, as much as I can, uh, over that. Uh, but ultimately we are fine. And to everybody who suggested, uh, or who offered, uh, us help, in order to be able to get to the family uh, gathering that we had planned to go to, which we did get to go to. We were able to find and rent a car on Canada Day, amazingly, uh, which is tough to do, but we did. We, go, we went and we had an amazing time with our family uh, out in the Lakefield area, uh, which was beautiful. So uh, uh, thank you. And there are even some people that offered, offered to send us money uh, to help us with it. Um, thank you. Very, very, very kind. We don't need it. Okay. Um, uh, we, 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 we are not, uh, we are not rich, uh, by any means, uh, but we are comfortable ish. We own a house, right? So we're comfortable ish, uh, which is not the case for everyone. Um, so thank you. Uh, very, very much appreciate the kindness. It warmed my heart. Um, uh, but we will not be accepting those offers. Uh, we don't, uh, we don't need to take away from anybody, uh, to be able to cover this. Um, uh, like this, uh, if you, if you want to donate to the show, absolutely. That's a completely different venture. You know, we're social capitalists. We want to make money. Uh, but for me personally, uh, we're good. Uh, but I was overwhelmed by the love 
And uh, I, I, I thank you so much, Kids and Cubs. Um, awesome. Yes. Uh, for those of you who are following our progress, uh, last I checked, we were at 3,910 uh, on our uh, YouTube subscribers. Uh, I saw some comments also about some uh, kits wondering uh, about uh, the numbers. Uh, we don't know. Don't know. We don't know. Uh, like right we, now in the live stream, there's 1,176 viewers. Yeah. We, we bought some advertising that we did do. As we mentioned, we talked about it on the show. Some people said we went and bought ourselves subscribers. We no. don't know if that's what YouTube does with it. Um, no. The one thing that I found interesting is that our um, uh, the viewer counts on our videos don't seem to be going up proportionally with our subscriber base. So we're ask, we wonder too because mm -hmm. we thought that there would be a change. Uh, we're noticing that on our main page uh, because we we have the live page where the video page uh, activity is boosting up a little bit on the video page. So maybe some of the new subscribers don't know uh, to go to video, um, but there's still not our numbers that are reflective of the growth of our subscriber base. So uh, we don't know uh, where the subscribers, uh, how it is that they're being accounted for and how, how, how they come uh, and what happens at the YouTube end of it. Uh, all that we know is that we seem to have, uh, when we hit 1,000, something happened to the algorithm or something, or maybe in combination with the, ad uh, with the advertising, and we seem to have been, uh, we seem to be growing. Uh, but uh, so we did not hit 4,000 prior to Canada Day. Uh, there, there might still be a chance that we hit it on Canada Day, but if I'm assuming that most people are out celebrating, probably might not be today. But hey, this is way, way, way more than we thought. We were hoping for a thousand. Yeah, we almost went four day. times that. So, so yeah, that's, that's a big jump. Um, we're not a lot of the new subscribers are from different parts of the world too, because this the ad campaign is airing in, uh, well, the United States, Canada, England, Scotland, Ireland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, South Africa. Australia, New Zealand, and the largest English-speaking spe nation on Earth, India. And I think 40% of the new subscribers are from India. So, thank you. Yeah. So, again, it might be a case of, um, like I said, don't know why so many people in India are, are interested specifically. And I would guess that it would probably be extraordinary to uh, assume that they would be um, daily viewers. Mm-hmm. So it might have something to do with the fact that we have uh, some uh, diplomatic tensions with the nation and therefore uh, uh, some people might be uh, a little more interested in uh, following us, uh, seeing if they have, we have anything in our descriptions that mention India at any given time. And then, um, and it could be like positive watching, like it could be people that are monitoring to see whether or not we say anything about India that some people find unflattering, unacceptable so that they can then post some comments and That's correct, nice. quote, yes that information. We don't know. So, um, yes, uh, for people that are wondering about the growth in numbers and say, Hey, it looks a little suspicious. Uh, from that point that that's what, what YouTube does. And we don't know how that works. We're still kind of new here. Um, but we assume, or I would like to assume that, uh, that these are people that are interested in our show and uh, we count you among our kids and cubs until we know better. <laughs> so welcome. And uh, however, if, whether you watch once a week or once a month, whether you're watching just for stuff that uh, mentions your country or whether you watch regularly, um, you know, maybe also could just be simple, simply uh, just everyday people in other nations who say, hey, what a cool initiative. I want, to I want to support that and click subscribe and then never watch. And that happens. A lot of people subscribe and just don't tune in. And Hey, that's look, I get it. You know, we like have this. busy lives. But, but clearly, like this having high subscriber number really makes us happy. But of course, you know, we prefer it when you watch. <laughs> of course. So, but yeah, that's kind of what's going on there, kids and cubs. So um, yeah, uh, don't uh please do not assume any ill intent on our part or us trying to be sneaky or underhanded. We don't know what's going on like this. We were trying to we knew that if we hit a thousand, something would happen. We did our best to hit that. We know that, you know, if you buy advertising, stuff is supposed to happen. So we tried that. Uh, 
we're just doing the things that we assume that we should do to in order to be able to grow and increase our reach and then the rest of it's kind of out of our hands mm -hmm. exactly. right uh okay mr grizzly do we have a show we do indeed all right, kids and yeah. cubs, that's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we loved making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and that word of mouth is priceless. So um, please let your peeps and poops know all about us. And if you would like to make sure that you do not miss an episode, well, hey, you do not have to. Why not make like the Ray Girl and go to our pod page site, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. I have to sneeze. Pardon me. Nice. Um, woo, um, I've actually been fighting it off for a couple of minutes. If you could hear in my voice every now and then I would get to a word and... <gasps> stop for a second <laughs> but it finally came out <laughs> hey it came out <laughs> one day after pride month <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> All right. uh, <laughs> so uh if you the qr code that will appear here will lead you to our pod page uh thanks to the ray girl for sponsoring it and uh, if you click there and click subscribe when we have something fresh off the bandwidth it will come directly to you um as soon as hopefully mr grizzly will put it up eventually there uh the qr code to get to our pod page um if you would like to support us in other ways make like kit elaine and go to the true north eager beaver media incorporated youtube page if you have not subscribed yet please do help us to get to four thousand uh the day is not over yet so technically we could still get to four thousand on canada day if not by so um day but if it doesn't it'll happen eventually that's fine we're good with that too. We thank you for your support so far. But while you're there, smash with our buttons, like, share, subscribe, get yourself some happy. Hey, you know what? It's Canada Day. Do it twice. It's not like anybody's watching. It's not like we judge. Just saying. <laughs> hey, we don't judge. No, and if no, you know, get freaky however you want. And if you would like to subscribe, uh, subscribe, support us in other ways, then please make your way to the Emergency Beaver Fund. No, that's not it. The Beaver Lodge Emergency Hydration Fund. There it is. That's what you call it. At our coffee page, help us celebrate the second birthday of our YouTube channel by going over there and encouraging us to do more. Got a couple of loonies. Hey, maybe even some Lucy Maud Montgomery ones jingling in your pocket. We'll keep those ones but the other ones if you want to send them our way we'd be very 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 happy to lighten your load this canada day so you scan the qr code by mr grizzly's head and that brings you to our coffee page ko-fi.com slash eager beaver lowercase letters all in one word and uh if you do that um then leave a bit of money there um as a uh, kit jen would say and again happy birthday darling help keep us <clears throat> moist <laughs> it's a hot day this canada day we need to stay hydrated especially if we want to return tomorrow after all this partying and celebrating mm -hmm. hey <laughs> from the beaver lodge this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there so please be kind to and gentle with yourself mr grizzly some words of wisdom please yeah if you're going to celebrate tonight and have a couple of wobbly pops don't drive. Mm. Please yes. don't drive. Take an Uber, a taxi, a bus. Make arrangements to stay over somewhere if you need to. Just don't don't drive if you're going to have. If you're going to imbibe, please don't drive. Yes. Yes. Very, very, very important. Make sure that everybody gets home safe and in one piece. Mm -hmm. That's how we prefer you, kids and cubs, in one piece. All right. <sighs> It could be a tough road out there, kids. Hopefully not today. But it can be a tough road out there. So please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, I think it might be time to cue the Canada cock. Um, sure. 
You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, the Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. Hello everyone, happy Canada Day. No matter where you are, I hope you're celebrating the incredible people, the land, and the story that is Canada. It's a story that began more than 157 years ago with indigenous peoples who've called this land home since time immemorial. It's a story of sacrifice. When Canadian soldiers stormed the beaches of Normandy, they knew they were risking their lives. But freedom, even for those across an ocean, even for generations of people they'd never meet, was worth fighting for. Our rights and freedoms are never guaranteed. They're safeguarded every day by trailblazers, journalists, activists, organizers, people who want to keep building a country where we can disagree, sometimes passionately, but where we always come together in the pursuit of something greater than ourselves. A country where everyone has a fair shot, no matter who they are, where they come from, how they pray, or whom they love. Those are the values that hold us together as Canadians. It's the reason so many people around the world save up everything they have and leave behind everything they know to be part of our story. It's a story that includes injustices, ones that we're confronting on our shared path of reconciliation. It's a story of learning, learning that we're stronger not in spite of our differences, but because of that. And it's a story that's still being written by incredible Canadians who step up for their community and country. From the workers and volunteers who cared for our most vulnerable in the long days of the pandemic, to the brave first responders who even now race towards danger to protect homes from wildfires, to the women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces who stand on the front lines fighting for democracy and freedom. People. Brave, kind, resilient people. That is the story of Canada. That's what makes our country the very best place on earth. So let's keep making it even better. Happy Canada Day.